1993, we're all anticipating Jurassic Park, Last Action Hero, and then sneaking in through a little bit through the window came out this movie. And I think it kind of got forgotten. Well, partially because Joe Dante, its director, wasn't really known for this type of movie. Right. This movie references the type of movies that Joe Dante would love, yes. but he was known as Piranha and The Howling and Gremlins and these horror-esque ideals. Right. And the first time I saw this when I was 13, I swear to God I thought it was a John Waters movie. <laughs> I mean, it, it sells itself like a John Waters movie. It does movie. kind yeah. of feel like it. So, of course, we're going to talk about a movie that's actually celebrated a lot far more now than it was back then. Mm -hmm. I think people, far more people know about it now than back then. Yeah. Matinee. Hey, Good. welcome back to the show, everybody. I'm one of your hosts, Kyle Gothy from GoatFilmReviews.com. I am Nick from the St. Paul Filmcast. Thanks for finding us. Thanks for watching. And for our loyal fans, thank you for continuing to support the show. You can follow the show on Twitter and on Instagram. Yes, we do have a Patreon. Check that out for some great deals and great content and an opportunity to tell us what movies we can review for future videos. Both Kyle and I are members of the Minnesota Film Critics Alliance. Check out that webpage for critic reviews as well as ours. And of course, please do us a solid by hitting that like and subscribe button and telling your friends about the show. Mm -hmm. And today we're talking about from 1993, Matinee. Yeah, so in 1962, during the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis, new military kid Gene and his mother have arrived in Key West, Florida. Gene confronts his loneliness with an obsession for horror films, particularly those associated with schlock director Lawrence Woolsey. When Gene discovers that Woolsey himself will be in town with his new film, Mant, he finds Mant, a way to get involved right. and meet his idol. Okay, so this movie is kind of nostalgic for the gimmick movies of the late 50s, early 60s. To get kids in the theater, they actually did these props and gadgets. Mm -hmm. to let them, you know. Most of them were William Castle, really, which is, I mean, yeah, if, William if you Castle, have, Lawrence right. Woolsey is based on anybody, it's absolutely William, William Castle. Castle. Um, there was there was very specific references in the film to William Castle. With the he mentions ghosts flying across the screen, which was thirteen ghosts. Yeah. He mentions the the shock moments in the the seats, the buzzers which is on the from seats, the tingler. Yeah. Um, even has a, a non-William Castle reference when he mentions Rumble Rama, which was very based on the uh, sense around which ended up destroying a couple theaters. And you actually, we talked about it in depth in an episode about the movie Earthquake. So check out that on our episode list as well. So it's very much based on the gimmicks of those, mm -hmm. of William Castle, of getting kids in the theaters, as well as selling it. You know, this is dangerous for your eyes. You know, we're going to give you barf bags before you when you yeah. enter the theater and all this stuff. Check your blood pressure and all that stuff. Do you have a heart condition? It's all the selling gag yeah. of watching this scary movie. And I think it's a nostalgic point of pointing the lens back because it's been 30 years mm -hmm. of in 1993 of what these movies and I'm sure Joe Dante was a sucker for these kind of movies when he was well, a kid. If you look at the kinds of films that he adored and the films that he made up until this point you know you get things like yeah Piranha was very much a rip off of Jaws but it was also yeah. a creature feature that was done the low budget style Roger Corman which is very much while he wasn't you know William Castle he was in that same Roger kind was of very thing. gimmicky, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then you get films like The Howling, where again, like it's a real throwback to the Universal Wolfman story, but done in a very tongue-in-cheek kind of a way. Yeah, and rather um, than a single person, it's a cult of them. Yeah, and yeah. even even Gremlins. Gremlins is literally monsters overtake Frank Capra, like that. You know, like it's yeah. a very idyllic home, and that's kind of what Matt Nafe. Let's do like. a mixture of comedy and horror. There's yeah. always I always talk about with Joe Dante. There's a little more comedy of it. He's horror. having fun making the movie, and it's yeah. noticeable, and it breathes through the audience, I think. Even though there's some horrific things, but my God, it's funny to look yeah. at and people's reactions. So, matinee's kind of weird, kind of how we got the engines begun, because it's almost like, <laughs> would you see it in a matinee? or Because it didn't it really do well in theaters. Yeah, it the kind film, of was a rental. The film was scripted by uh, Charlie Haas, right. who would later go on to do Gremlins 2, The New Batch, the incredibly underrated, uh, as well as a film called Martians Go Home with uh, Randy Quaid. Uh, Charlie Haas did not do the main first draft of the screenplay, though. That was actually done by Jericho Stone. And that film was drastically different. There's the bones of the same movie are there. Yeah. It was about a bunch of friends who would go to this movie theater, but it was more of a fantasy about the films that they fell in love with ah. and kind of played off those elements. It seemed like, not exactly like the films come to life, but elements of kind yeah. of falling, falling into your favorite films, if you will. 
And then the film would end with these characters 30 years later going there to that theater and finding out that it was a video store and that the magic was still kind of there. That was the bones of the original type of film. Very different than what we had, although I would like to see that screenplay made into a movie because it sounds kind of cool. <laughs> Even though you tell me that story, it still needs, I feel, that story needs to bake in the oven a little bit longer. Yeah, and, that's, and it baked. It just maybe didn't bake the way Jericho Stone wanted it to. He actually yeah. uh, tried to get involved with the WGA and, and get his name placed as a screenwriter, but he just got a story credit, so... And so, matinee, it's heightened around the 90s because we have a lot of things. Talking about the 60s, we had the Wonder Years on TV mm -hmm. every Sunday night. And then you have a lot of other movies relative to the 60s. But this one kind of feels almost like 50s rather than 60s. Yeah, it's almost like post-1980s because we saw around 1988, 89, the 80s aesthetic was kind of crumbling. It was 80s kind of looking back to the else. 50s, right? Yeah, and so and it's almost like... Six, 90s looking back to the 60s. Well, we have yeah. it a lot, though, where like when we when we as a culture lose our aesthetic and our identity, we look back at one. We're doing that right now. We did that over the last 10 years where we looked back to the 80s a lot, and now it's kind of like we're morphing into looking back to the 90s a lot. Yeah. It's like we're, we as a culture right now are lost in looking for an identity, and so we look back. And it's almost like I that was it. happening in the early 90s as well. I kind of get it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you get kind of a person that's famous for just being on television because he still was on Roseanne at the time because you have John Goodman who's actually going to carry the whole movie. Yeah, I'm trying to think of like another main starring film that he had done. I know King Ralph was about this time yeah. um, and he of course he appeared in Revenge of the Nerds. He had a very quick moment in the movie Chud but yeah, Roseanne was kind of his claim to He was to like fame. a TV guy yeah. carrying the movie. Yeah, it's kind of weird and then you got a Kathy. Kathy Moriarty who again, she was probably the name at this point because yeah. of Raging Bull. Um, and you know, that same year, she'd also have Casper that would come out where she was the villain. She'd done, uh, was it Soap Dish? She seems like the villain in this. Yeah, in, in many ways. I mean, and, and that was kind of her shtick. She kind of had this angry, yeah. ornery, cranky human, you know. <laughs> but the thing about it was she was probably the name of the film because I can't think of any other actor who would have the level that she did. Maybe Goodman just because of Roseanne, but I don't know. If and you know, you, you, of course, for me, being raised in the 80s, when you see Dick Miller, you'd be like, that's Dick Miller! Yeah, <laughs> who's doing? He's out there campaigning Everybody against the Leo point. <laughs> yeah, he's out. Yeah, the Leo point. But that, that's me because he's always disgruntled. He's almost doing. Dick Miller always kind of does the Kathy Morari role in, in movies that she's doing in this. She's always like, "I wish I was somewhere else." Yeah, and Dick Miller's actually is like trying to save you from the movies that he's been in. Well, what I really appreciate about Dick Miller <laughs> showing up is that he was in like every Joe Dante movie. Yeah. Um, and he just kept showing up, and he kept being, and he was never there for a lot. You know, he was always there. I mean, I think in this film he got like he three plays, scenes. Uh, Herb Denning, who was a, a washed-up actor, <laughs> that kind of had to kind of take on this role of uh, helping Woolsey sell his films, which is very much what Dil Dick Miller was doing to Joe Dante. So, yeah. um, if you haven't watched the movie, you haven't seen it yet, and then the movie in the movie, you see a little bit of Naomi Watts. Yeah, that was the what was the movie called? Uh, uh, I had written it down because that was great. The Shook Up Shopping Cart. This is her U.S. debut. Yeah, uh, I think she would follow this up by being the star in one of the Children of the Corn films, I believe, number four. And then, and then um, she would do Mulholland, Mulholland yeah, Drive. Yeah, and then she would finally break out and have something really worthwhile. But I was kind of in shock to see her in this kind of uh, pseudo Disney film that yeah. she was doing. You know, there was a lot of those during those the sixties, 60s. 60s, early sixties, um, Herbie Love Bug, and all that stuff. My right? father, the car, or something like that. Right, you know? very. <laughs> Shlashky. I would watch the Shook Up Shopping Cart, though. Let me be clear. If you make that into a feature film, I would watch the hell out of it. The but the you have to get cart. Naomi Watts in there. So the whole premise, if you didn't know, is the wonder of being a kid wanting to go see. It's almost a kid's perspective of mm -hmm. the entire, because you get two different angles. you got the sales, salesman, what do you want to do in the industry? Then you got the kid's perspective of receiving the end of, I'm going to see a scary movie. Yep. And so you have these two dynamics going side by side. Yeah. And so I think that's the gimmick of Joe Dante. He could remember him being a kid in the 60s and what it felt like, but also the director's point of view of how do I sell this to people. Yeah, it's a perfect look back kind of a film. There's that nostalgic love, but the thing about nostalgia is that it's used best when it's used for story purpose, which is what Joe Dante is doing here. Is he is yeah. looking back on the things that he loved. You see that uh, famous Monsters of Filmland uh, magazine yeah. that Gene is looking through? That's something that 15-year-old Joe Dante wrote to. He wrote an article that ended up in there about the 50 worst movies ever made. 
Uh, spoiler alert: He hadn't seen most of them, but uh, <laughs> he wrote a bunch of these like things for them. And that's so such a, that's such, such a something you yeah. would do that. Yeah, but yeah, I think he like. How do you also love for that? I don't have to see it. Yeah. yeah, there's a certain love for that time period though, and I think that shines through both in the movie, in the movie, and also in Gene's character. I mean, Gene is very much an archetype of myself from the '90s. When I was a kid, I, I could gobble up horror movies by the handful and and just give me more give me more I would go out and rent like five six on a weekend and just rip through some fun stuff and some of the other films I didn't really care for as much you know the, the shook up shopping carts of the world I didn't it's, care for as much it's funny there's a love triangle in this movie it kill, kills me <laughs> yeah it's weird it's a weird teenage love triangle but the girl the, the girl's her younger brother I love him I got your diary yeah and He's just eat. kind of involved being a, a dirtbag. Yeah. <laughs> dirtbag child. <laughs> I'm going to spill him the secrets unless he take me to this movie. I love it. That yeah. kid is going places, man. <laughs> what I like about the, the the film, we'll get further into our view as we go along, yeah. but uh, what I really like about it is that it's kind of this confluence of all these people saying they're not going to get to the movie, and then they all end up there anyway for the for the insanity. It's exactly um, what happened when we went to the 90s for the video star. I'm not going to get a movie. And then you go and you're like, what? I'm just going to look around. Yeah. And then yeah. you leave with a bag with like six of them in there. Or your friend's like, I'm going to go see a movie and like, I'll go somewhere else. And then you find them at the movie store. That's happened. Yeah. Uh, Omri Katz appears in the film. This is, uh, he plays the friend Stan. Uh, and if you're a fan of Hocus Pocus, you know Omri Katz because he was the lead actor in that film. Uh, I initially knew Omri Katz from the show Erie, Indiana which was a, oh. a one-season show that lasted. In fact, Joe Dante directed five episodes of that show. He and that needed it. That, uh, that was a devastating cancellation yeah. for all of us. Uh, Joe Dante is one of those guys who he directed a good amount of television, but he seemed like he had a cursed touch and that he made great episodes of those shows, and then those shows got canceled almost immediately afterwards. He also did two or three episodes of Police Squad, the Naked Gun television series that was canceled after six episodes. Those are great. And those are great as well. Those um, are great. They're but, like just boom, boom, boom. But right. he definitely didn't have a real great touch when he would when you would make an episode and the show would get canceled. Uh, maybe he's the reason why Masters of Horror only lasted two seasons was because he yeah. did a couple episodes of that show and it disappeared as well. <laughs> but I like the, before we get to our review, I would like the caption of it hmm. because there's it's almost like a kid's show. It's almost so like it's a kid's family show. Mm. And I think it's what the audience are you going for. And that's, of course, perfect timing for our review. Yeah, yeah. definitely. So, of course, up next is our review of Matinee. Mm -hmm. So I've seen this probably about four or five times. And I think the crutch of it is what kind of lead into it. Who is this for? Because I don't think you're catching a wider net, an audience for this. Plus, are you, is it for the people Joe Dante's age? Is it for the kids, you know, or the, for a family? Mm -hmm. And I think that's where people kind of, it got lost in the wind just purely by what is it looking, yeah. Yeah, Dante credits the film as probably shouldn't have been made um, because the production studio that was paying for it went bankrupt and they went and begged, I think it was Universal, uh, or it might have been Paramount to to take up the rest of the film and finish paying for it. And okay. he was like, and they shouldn't have said that because the movie was not even close to finish, and they did. And I'm so thankful they did, but the movie also didn't make any money. So right. that's the question about it. Is I feel like it's its best audience, the closest approximation is probably going to be people that are Joe Dante's age that grew up watching 50s B horror and love it and respect it still. Yeah. The thing is, not many people. I don't think many people in the 90s looked upon the 50s horror films the way we look on the 50s horror films today. Right. I don't think, I think they were the forgotten child. And we were anticipating going forward so much in the 90s. I mean, yeah. at early 90s, we had those Technomarias were coming out. We had um, all of those disaster movies, new disaster movies. We had Dracula, mm -hmm. um, Jurassic Park. Yeah, those are well, conversations. Then you had this little movie that's kind of kid-friendly, PG, and you're like... I'm not interested. You made a good point, though, when you said yeah. that that same year Jurassic Park came out. And I think Jurassic Park was definitely, like, I would say one of the top five biggest advances in technology and film right. ever put to film. I still think to this day, and you can check out our episode Jurassic Park, those dinosaurs look amazing still, 30 years later. That is a great mm -hmm. piece of technology. The problem is, the same year, you have a guy celebrating Man in Suit movie and a bunch of things flying at the screen. Yeah. There's just this kind of inability to reconcile the two. Because I think, yeah, the movie audiences, as seen by Jurassic Park's amount of money that it took in, wanted to move forward yep. and not look back. And I think 
I think nowadays we look back on the 50s with some love, partially because we can stream all these movies for free, usually. <laughs> yeah, and it's a wonderful... I, I enjoy being... I enjoy watching the movie. Yeah. And I think the problem is, is the content, what are you pulling for, as well as timing. Mm-hmm. I think your timing is about five years off. I think if you did this movie in 1988... 88, yeah, because I was going to yeah. say 98 might be even worse. <laughs> if you did this movie in 88, boom, you got a kind of a seller bring your kids to the movie because there wasn't a lot of kid friendly movies you can go see in 88 yeah because even the film uh, that came out what was in 91 we talked about a movie called Popcorn that was also kind of a send up of those kinds of movies also check out that episode Um, and that had bad timing that one had bad timing but it made a little bit more than Matt I think it was a little bit more (laughs) successful than Matt and A was because it at least was a horror film right because it at least could sell (laughs) what the audience even though the title is bad yeah (laughs) But yeah, it's hard to sell this movie when everything is so we're ready to move on. We just got the internet, for God's sakes. We're all going forward, and we want to do this little piece. Not to mention, on TV, Wonder Years is still a big hit. It's like the number one show outside of Mm X-Files. So if you want your 60s nostalgia, you just go plug that in for free. That's true. And I think Wonder Wonder Years had a bit more of a, I don't want to say a hopefulness to it, but a bit more of warts and all about the time period of growing up. Yeah. You know, they it looked back on that and it tackled some heavy issues whereas this film is very much about a specific kind of love. And not every person in, in going to see your movie is going to be like, oh, remember 50s big buck movies? Like, right. no one's really thinking about that. Yeah. Um, there was such a small group of people, a convalescence of people that would like the the ghosts coming out of the screen and and you know the weird kinds of glasses that you can wear it's not something that was popular then I'm not entirely sure it was popular even now enough where you could really make this movie and make a killing but it made it's the movie for you oh absolutely <laughs> no like like I said I'm I'm Gene in this movie because yeah. I could eat that kind of stuff up I love the aesthetic of Matt I and do May. I do um, because what I I think I, this is just a theory of mine but he made this you know cheap looking Matt movie you know he kind of made the movie within a movie I think he made this film, though, the rest of Matinee, with the same kind of tech that you would use in 50s movies. Because all the sets look kind of cheap. They look yeah. kind of small and like the home is very undeveloped, except it's just got a, a crap ton of posters. I think the home know. is on set, you know, yeah. when we do, we, you, t- you have no roof. Yeah, I think that's purposely you don't done see the roof. Yeah. to give the film a 50s flair, because it reminds me of the 1950s movies. Um, and, and, Part of you know I've been there's a video game I love called Destroy All Humans, which is about an alien in the 50s that goes to a town and basically tries to kill everyone, um, and you play as the alien, and that has the same kind of send up style to it of 1950s ness where it's like we're making fun of it, but we're also loving that time period. We're loving that kind of peculiar yeah. we're gonna die at any moment time period. That <laughs> MGM color to it, but then mm-hmm. you're throwing a little hokiness monster into it, but you're all enjoying having a fun yeah it's also playing on the dynamics of being real anxiety versus selling anxiety real fear of the real world but then to escape that fear we're going to go get scared at the movies yeah it's what happened yeah. during the 30s you know we had the the stock market crash and you go see dracula then the great depression and yeah you just went to see because somebody and else Lord was King getting Kong. hurt yeah you know uh, in the 80s, we kind of had this response to the Reaganomics of the time and the response to the, the tightening of the purse strings of things like Dungeons & Dragons. We wanted to go see something that we weren't supposed to see. And so through most of the 80s, a lot of the horror was the nth degree. I, yeah. um, there, you know, These are responses to their time periods. And maybe it was because in the early 90s, we had a lot of problems in our country, but they weren't as on the wall. They weren't in every news piece. And maybe that was why this film didn't work as well, is because people didn't need to escape in the same way that we did. Exactly. Mm-hmm. But I would uh, recommend giving this, this movie a, a shot. Yeah, I yeah. found it for uh, in a pack with nine other movies for five bucks at Target, so you can probably get it pretty cheap. Yeah, it's um, available for pretty cheap on rentals for all the streaming services. Yeah, so you've got you know you've got John Goodman, who I think gives a not a career best performance, but one of his best performances. Oh, when he tickles that guy's ear and grabs his popcorn? Oh, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> it's just, he knew everything that his character was supposed to do. Yeah. And it's amazing that he is an actor. I mean, this is what he was known for in the time period, as being the kind of goofy guy, and yeah. he is goofy in there. But there's a lot of heart in what he's doing. When he talks about, about what you see on the screen, 
and and kind of compares the idea of like covering your eyes is not what you want to do. The point of watching the movie is to subject yourself to the scares so that you get stronger because you know you survived it. Yeah. I love that sequence with him and, and Simon. And Fenton. they don't get a refund. We don't have a second show. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> don't, there's no money for that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think I think Simon Fenton does a pretty good job. I think Omri Katz is really great. Uh, Kelly Martin, who plays uh, Sherry, who's the love interest for Stan, the friend. Yep. Uh, I think she's really good for what she's supposed to do. She would later go on to voice the the romantic interest in the Goofy movie. Um, and the other person I really want to celebrate is Lisa Jacob, who plays uh, Sandra, who is the love interest for uh, Jean. At the end, yeah. Um, the girl that gets pulled away because she said, what's the point in hiding under our, our book bags? We're just yeah. going to get obliterated by the bomb. She's like the conscientious character. Yeah. yeah, I think she showcases in this film such a warmth and such a gentility that is really strong in the film. She would later go on to do Mrs. Doubtfire and Independence yeah. Day. You would recognize, um, yeah, she's like my age, yeah. Yeah, and I think she is. It's it's tragic that she didn't get as many film roles as she deserved because I thought she was phenomenal in this movie. Yep. Not a big part, but she makes every bit of it work. Yeah. Um, there's also Robert Picardo. God, I love Robert Picardo as the, the theater manager. <laughs> Robert! <laughs> um, but for me, the only thing that kind of falls apart in the film is I do think near the end of the film, I was kind of hoping that more of these storylines would intersect, and they don't really. No. It kind of feels like multiple different I would say the weak point of the story is they didn't know how to really close it. Yeah, because there's the whole sequence with the, the bomb shelter that you'd think would be the end of the film, but it's not really. They solve that, and then... There's the the boyfriend, the angry boyfriend in the ant cost, or yeah, the mantis costume. Yeah, that is, you know, that part gets solved, but it's kind of not the end of the film. We keep jumping to different climaxes, and I wish that the film had coalesced. Should it end at the theater? Yeah, right. So there's there's definitely it's not a perfect movie, but I really had fun with this one. Yeah, mm -hmm. have you seen the matinee? You should see it in a matinee. Yeah. Uh, every time you watch it too you can have a fun little game you can try and figure out where the different film scores are from um, <laughs> because I found quite a few myself that Jerry Goldsmith inserted he has references to Son of Dracula mm -hmm. all the Creature from the Black Lagoon movies I love it there's like sam space. little dance I forgot about that yeah. little dance samples of it yeah. and I really enjoy that so that's the fun yeah. game next time you watch the movie or if you haven't seen it before that's a great thing to do as well is to try and find all those different yeah if you're a horror movies. fan who likes to go see scary movies it's and you know, yeah yeah, so yeah. definitely, yeah, let us know your thoughts on Matinee down below. I thought it was a, a beautiful tribute to the movies that no one loves, that certain people love. Uh, and, and we'd love to hear your thoughts down below. And maybe tell us, too, this is, I think, our first Joe Dante film on the show. Oh, gosh. So you got to tell insulting. us which one we should do next, because every time we hit one of these milestones of first director, I'm like, how the hell have we not done this yet? <laughs> um, so let us know what your favorite Joe Dante film is, He's and maybe we we'll end up covering it. Or comedy guy. Yeah, and one way you can also make sure is, Click on that Patreon, and you can yes, tell us please. which Joe Dante film he wants to cover. Yeah. Simple yeah. enough. <laughs> tell us. Um, yeah, thank yeah. you guys for joining us. You can find oh, all my you. film reviews over at GoatFilmReviews.com. Really, thank you very much. And uh, you can find my show at the St. Paul Filmcast anywhere you find podcasts. And we'll see you at the matinee.